Hi, everyone. Welcome. You are at the Silver Hill Hospital Ran Rounds program, and we'll get started in just a moment. Welcome, everybody. I am Dr. Jeff Katzman, the Director of Education here at Silver Hill Hospital, and we are absolutely delighted to have you join us and are very privileged to welcome Dr. Nosheen Ranjbar presenting on the topic, Integrative Psychiatry, the Growing Evidence, Training Opportunities, and Practice. And I will have the pleasure and honor of introducing her in just a moment. First, a little bit of housekeeping. Our next Grand Rounds will take place on May 10th where we welcome uh, Dr. Joanne DeSanto Janaco, who will talk to us on the impact of aggression exposure on psychiatric workers, a call for changes in practice. And we are uh, very uh, looking forward to welcoming, welcoming her as well. But back to today's lecture, questions, as you know, remain an important part of our Grand Rounds program. I will moderate a Q&A discussion with Dr. Ranjbar at the end of her lecture, and this is your opportunity to put forward questions and comments to Dr. Ranjbar. You can submit a question anytime during the lecture by using the Q&A box, either with your name or if you prefer, you can submit it anonymously. To receive continuing education credits, please kindly complete the evaluation survey that will pop in the browser, up in the browser when the webinar ends. We will also email a copy of the survey to today's participants. As a reminder to our social work participants, today's lecture is approved for NASW of Connecticut for Cultural Competency for Licensure Renewal. And finally, disclosures. No planners of this activity have indicated a relevant financial relationship with an ACCME defined ineligible company whose primary business is producing, marketing, selling, reselling, or distributing healthcare products used by or on patients. It is now my great pleasure and honor to introduce our guest speaker today, <clears throat> Dr. Nosheen Ranjbar. I will just say we were meeting in the a uh, few minutes before we got started, and I let uh, Dr. Ranjbar know that uh, I've heard of uh, of her work as many people um, throughout the Southwest who I know have participated in her training programs in integrative psychiatry, and it is really a, truly an honor, um, Dr. Ranjbar, to welcome you uh, to Silver Hill today. Nosheen Ranjbar was born and raised in Tehran, Iran, until immigrating to the U.S. in adolescence. Dr. Nosheen Ranjbar developed a passion for a holistic view of medicine and healing from early on in her life. Throughout her studies and life experiences, including her own illness, as well as caring for her mom, who suffered from several autoimmune illnesses and cancer, to fostering refugee children with PTSD, to working with American Indian communities across the U.S., she developed a keen interest in approaches to healing trauma and advocating for holistic mental health in empowering culturally appropriate ways. Dr. Ranchbar completed undergraduate <clears throat> medical school at the University of Virginia, followed by family medicine internship at Middlesex Hospital at Hartford Hospital and psychiatry residency at the University of Arizona, Tucson and Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Fellowship at Boston Children's Hospital, Harvard Medical School. She is board certified in general psychiatry, child and adolescent psychiatry, and integrative medicine. Uh, Dr. Ranspar currently serves as associate clinical professor of psychiatry and director of the integrative psychiatry program at the University of Arizona. She also serves as on faculty with the Center for Mind-Body Medicine, the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine, and the Integrative Psychiatry Institute. And I also learned in our pre-session that Dr. Ranspar spent five years at the West Haven VA as a research coordinator on three different projects. So it is great, even if uh, only virtually, to welcome you back to Connecticut. Her research focuses on training the next generation of psychiatrists to offer a holistic approach to mental health while serving children and families most in need. As a Robert Wood Johnson culture of health leader, she's expanding her work in integrated mental health and in indigenous mental health nationally and internationally. Over the past two years, she's been helping lead efforts 
for professional training programs in mind-body medicine for Iranians in and outside Iran. So Dr. Ranjbar, with that, it is an honor to hand the baton to you and thank you again so much for, uh, for teaching us today. Thank you, Dr. Katzman. This is an absolute pleasure. Uh, sometimes when we do these virtual presentations, we don't even recognize how we're coming back home to some place in the country. And, um, and I'm just uh, really, really delighted to reconnect with my life in Connecticut in a way through all of you um, who might be in that area. Welcome home. Yes. Thank you. Um, so we will have about um, 60 to 70 minutes of me sharing. Um, and I encourage you all to jot down your comments and questions. And I hope that this is the beginning of a conversation and a discussion about a field that is emerging and growing and has incredible potential for our own well being as healthcare physicians, clinicians, other providers, as well as our patients and our communities. So I encourage you to, to reach out um, both during the Q&A, but also beyond that. Um, here are my disclosures, as Dr. Katzman also mentioned. And I'm going to start with telling you a little bit of a story about my own journey. Um, this is actually part of my own um, authenticity uh, leadership building efforts is to, um, to practice sharing more about where I've been and how I got to do what I do. And it will actually tie in to some of the cultural um, pieces of this presentation, as well as the community outreach and actually the growing field of integrative medicine and psychiatry and trauma. So this is me as a three or four year old little girl in Tehran, um, probably in the late 70s. I was born in 1977. Um, and when I was two years old, the, um, the Islamic revolution took place in Iran. My parents got divorced and my world changed without even realizing that was happening. And uh, Throughout that time, I, um, I was actually in Iran until I was 12. So when I was eight or nine, oh, this keeps shifting on me. Uh, when I was eight or nine, I, um, the Iran-Iraq war was taking place. I remember my mom rushing me to the bomb shelters to uh, get away from the bombing, sometimes traveling to Turkey so that we could uh, escape the, the, the trauma of the war for a week or two at a time before having to come back to school and work. Uh, this is uh, the house I lived in, little condo, um, uh, the last place I lived in in Iran, in Tehran. And then I moved um, at age 12 uh, when my mom was diagnosed with cancer and um, couldn't no longer take care of me or herself, she um, moved to a hospice program in Vienna, Austria, to spend the last uh, days of her life. And I um, had the opportunity to come move with my father who was living in Virginia. So I moved to Richmond, Virginia, um, where I did my undergrad, uh, my um, middle school, high school, and then to Charlottesville, University of Virginia, where I did undergrad and medical school. Uh, but the reason this part is really important is that I never really knew how to deal with everything that I had faced from my mom's illness to the war to moving to a new country, learning English, feeling out of place, being bullied, uh, many other things, losing my mom, probably one of the most important things. And, um, and so at some point, um, excuse my... Uh, <laughs> technical difficulties. Um, at some point, all of this caught up with me. So as I was an intern um, in family medicine, I went into family medicine um, at Middlesex Hospital, I started to develop um, burnout. At the time, I didn't know that's what it was, anxiety, feelings of not being able to do my job, even though I was exceptionally hardworking and um, a, a great student up until that point. 
And so it was as if my body and my mind were just kind of giving up on me and I wanted to move forward. And it was my first job out of medical school, you know, being an intern and, and the long hours. And um, But it, my body and my mind were just not cooperating. So that turned into a lot of shame and anxiety and <clears throat> not knowing what to do and who to tell and um, thankfully, I had an amazing mentor at Middlesex Hospital who uh, shepherded me to find a psychiatrist and find a therapist and begin to, the process of figuring out how to get help, which I resisted for a long time, but eventually listened. Um, and that led to me actually needing to eventually resign from uh, my uh, residency program in family medicine. And I have to say that that was probably... The hardest thing I've ever done was to leave a profession that I had worked so hard and had half a million dollars worth of debt to pay back and um, and a lot of investment, you know, from my family and life and friends. So uh, it actually got a lot darker at that time because now I didn't have the job um, as an intern that gave me a lot of sense of identity and who I was and and what I was good at and turned me into a full-time patient and I did not like that that was a big um that was a big it felt like a failure to me at that time and so I actually got more depressed um I got to the point of being suicidal needing to be hospitalized it was it was horrendous um and I'm sharing that with you because as you will hear about this emerging field and and where we're going um, in mental health and and in, in our healthcare system from from an integrative psychiatry perspective, um, uh, I hope that you will see uh, where this all fits in. So, as a burned out, uh, depressed, uh, feeling like a failure, uh, medical intern, no longer. I got a job at Yale um, as a research coordinator. Um, as Dr. Katzman mentioned, I worked at the uh, West Haven VA for five years um, and it saved my life in a way. I found an amazing mentor in internal medicine who took me under her wings. The research was on neuroplasticity and stroke and sleep apnea and neuro rehabilitation and robotics. So interestingly, as I was going to see therapists and, you know, figuring out who I was and learning how to process the grief that I had never been able to process and, you know, trying to rebuild a sense of uh, what I was here to do in the world, um, I actually had this job that was teaching me about neuroplasticity and the capacity of the human brain and nervous system to rebuild and rewire and re-network. And, uh, and at the same time, I, um, you know, had done a lot of uh, work on myself. I ended a, a a relationship that was not healthy for me at that time. And that all kind of uh, led to me having more spaciousness and more energy to do new things with my time. And one of those things was um, doing some volunteering at the International Rescue Committee, um, IRC of New Haven. Uh, and that led me to become a foster mom of three uh, children with PTSD, two from Afghanistan, uh, whose mom had uh, had uh, taken them and fled Afghanistan during the war and had just arrived to West Haven and New Haven area as refugees and asylum seekers. Uh, mom had tried to take her own life. The kids happened to know me as an auntie who was doing volunteer work uh, with the IRC and they moved in with me. The state of Connecticut made me a foster mom um, so that it could be an official way of, of them, um, of, of having me in their lives. And, and that all led to continued uh, watching these children's brains with uh, incredible traumas they'd faced, both in, in their initial country, but also moving to America, dealing with all the cultural challenges, um, learning English, uh, taking care of their mom who was who's suffering perhaps not too different from how I had tried to take care of my mom when when I was a little girl so uh, that all led uh, as I was getting my own healing and learning about neuroplasticity and um, and the human mind and the brain and healing and and what 
uh, conventional medicines and therapies had to offer and the vast arena of culturally uh, empowering ways and, and creative ways that I also found helpful for me and these children who were living with me. That all led me to come to a place in my journey to say, okay, I'm ready to go back to training, which I didn't know that I was ever going to be able to do. So part of that was um, finding a new residency program, and the University of Arizona happened to have a, a spot, and I uh, in interviewed and, and fell in love with the desert, and, and I knew that it was also where the Andrew Weil Center for Innovative Medicine was, which was actually the reason I'd gone to Middlesex Hospital to begin with because they were one of the first family medicine residencies in the country to be part of a pilot uh, series of residency programs in family medicine, bringing an integrative medicine curriculum uh, for their residents. Uh, so I had already known about the Andrew Well Center. So when I got into the U of A, University of Arizona uh, psychiatry residency, it was just perfect because I knew that I could reconnect with a whole field that had been there and I had wanted to learn more about and my body and my mind had needed a long break in between. So long story short, uh, coming to U of A led me to also reconnect with a really powerful part of my journey back in medical school that had been a visit to the Pine Ridge Reservation and Rapid City um, and a meeting of the indigenous people of the United States. And I um, will just uh, briefly go back to that time in medical school at University of Virginia when I'd taken a summer, my only summer off as a first year medical student. Um, to go out to uh, work and serve the, you know, within the reservations. And it was the first time in my life that I had actually felt at home in America when I met the Lakota people. Um, this is a beautiful star quilt from, from the Lakota Nation um, to remind me of, of the depth of culture, generosity of spirit, um, down to earthness um, that drew me to, to the beautiful indigenous people. And I had had a dream of someday being able to return and serve them if and when I actually had skills um, to offer. And so as, um, as I continued my journey in, in at the University of Arizona, I went through training through the Center for Mind-Body Medicine, which opened up some channels of uh, creating a volunteer team to start going out to Pine Ridge and offering mind-body skills workshops and groups and churches and shelters and substance abuse rehab centers. And that grew into a fully funded uh, multiple year uh, program for suicide prevention in Native youth, et cetera, and what is now the Indigenous Initiative at the Center for Mind-Body Medicine, which I'll share a little bit more with you about bringing culturally congruent ways of um, introducing evidence-based medicine, which is really part of this growing field of integrative medicine and integrative psychiatry um, to support people who um, may otherwise uh, feel a gap in our, in our medical and healthcare and mental health care system. And this can actually be a bridge to seeking support and help in ways that empower them. So long story short, I'm almost done. Um, University of Arizona residency, and then I went to Boston Children's to study child and adolescent psychiatry. The Boston Marathon bombing happened while I was there, and I was able to uh, begin to apply some of what I was learning in mind-body medicine to support a, um, a program for the Boston Public Schools um, in the aftermath of the trauma. Uh, that led to eventually coming back uh, finishing fellowship at Harvard and then coming back to U of A as part of uh, my first job out of fellowship um, to the University of Arizona, where I did the integrative medicine fellowship and completed that. And then with my colleagues, uh, with my colleague, Dr. Emilia Villagomez, who is a graduate of the Yale uh, residency program in psychiatry, we helped create what is now the integrative psychiatry program with multiple um, branches all around the country and growing, which you're about to hear a lot more about. Uh, I continue to do work with uh, Native youth as part of the diabetes prevention, metabolic syndrome prevention youth camp here in Arizona. 
Um, I continue to work with the Indigenous Initiative that's now national through the Center for Mind Body Medicine. This is me in Pine Ridge doing some reflection about 12 years ago, doing some work in the community in Arizona after the Gabby Giffords shooting when I was still a resident. And then most recently over the past three years, uh, supporting the Iranian community in Iran and in the diaspora to uh, bring a lot of these tools and programs to, um, to them. So, and this is where I live right now uh, in Tucson, Arizona, and I'm very fortunate to be able to live way out in the middle of nowhere. Um, so thank you for listening to that um, with me. Uh, it's a lot. And it, it puts into perspective what I'm about to share with you about this uh, incredibly um, uh, powerful field that is growing probably in its um, toddlerhood still. <laughs> Uh, but has incredible potential to serve uh, humanity, uh, patients, and providers alike, uh, both to support our own well-being and processing and um, thriving as, as clinicians, uh, and also impact communities beyond the, the office and the hospital um, and into the communities. So here are our learning objectives. And I'm going to start with um, what is integrative psychiatry? Uh, integrative psychiatry, at least this version of, of how we define it, uh, thanks to the work of Dr. James Lake and Chanel Higgelson and other colleagues, uh, can be thought of in this way. Uh, and it's, as you'll see, really not... Uh, anything other than good medicine. Uh, so adoption of a truly bio-psycho-socio-spiritual paradigm, treating people as an individual whole person, uh, connecting them with their strengths uh, within a context of a community culture uh, that they are from and live in and serve and belong to, pursuing uh, Caus causality, uh, or at least contributing factors, really branching out as providers when we see someone in front of us who's who's struggling. Uh, what are what are the potential contributing factors behind their struggle, um, as well as their resiliency factors, and and what really um, has gotten them to get to where they are now, despite the challenges. Uh, utilizing <clears throat> evidence-based both <clears throat> conventional practices, but also things that are not yet conventional, and yet there is evidence to support them enough that we can truly integrate um, those practices into our treatment planning and what we offer our patients. Uh, do, do this uh, so that we can be more judicious in our use of uh, pharmacotherapies uh, and more expensive or more uh, potential side effect type of interventions. Um, consider uh, in the narrative, the story of the person in front of us, not just the diagnosis. Um, do this from a preventative health promotion, uh, well-being focused uh, perspective. Be um, uh, able to focus on empowering, educating, supporting people to take um, responsibility, but also agency for their health and their journey of healing. And do this all in a compass compassionate, unconditional, person-centered, culturally congruent, trauma-informed approach. I'm adding a few uh, bullets to that last one. Uh, so in a way, it's a tall order, and it's uh, really, really comprehensive, but it speaks to what happens when we don't see a human, a patient, a case in this way, because there are so many places where that gap or not considering things more holistically can um, draw a gap between us and the patient um, and reduce trust or reduce efficacy and effectiveness of the treatment that we do offer. 
So, and that is why the field of integrative medicine and integrative psychiatry is expanding like wildfire because of patient community and public demand. Uh, that goes from natural products. Uh, in 2017, uh, the NHIS survey showed 17, more than 17% 17 of Americans used some sort of sup supplement other than vitamins and minerals. Uh, most commonly used being fish oil, mind-body practices, uh, most popular being yoga and chiropractic and osteopathic manipulation, meditation techniques, uh, other approaches like traditional healers, Ayurvedic medicine, traditional Chinese practices, homeopathy, naturopathy, functional medicine. And, uh, and you've already seen up to this point in the bullets that our medical schools and residency programs don't really teach us much of anything um, about these things and their evidence. So unless we have had experiences in our own lives or our families or happen to go take a CME course in yoga or meditation or something else, supplements, we, most of us, certainly myself in medical school and residency training, um, didn't have access to like, where is the evidence? How do I truly meet this patient where they're at, support them to connect with their culture the way it makes the most sense to them, and help them be safe and not uh, waste their, their finances and resources on things that might be harmful or are interacting with their medications or whatever else that I may be prescribing, because that's what I was taught. So, so that's where the gap is that this field is helping to connect is to really support medical students, residents, fellows, uh, faculty who are already out in practice to begin to learn uh, where the state of the evidence is and stay as, as up to date with all of that as possible so that we can both help ourselves if, if any of these things uh, are applicable for our own well-being, but also know how to answer people's questions so that they don't not tell us what they are doing or what they're thinking or how they're feeling about their treatment plan because they, don't, they think that we are not going to understand or we're just going to judge them or say, oh, you know, that there's no evidence for that, even though there might be, and we just weren't taught it. And so the reason this ties into JEDI and diversity, equity, inclusion topics um, that are so near and dear to my heart is that in order for us to decolonize how we practice medicine, decolonize how we do mental health care, um, and we really do have to find bridges and 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 find a humble stance of uh, this is where this is where my knowledge ends and this is where I want to learn about you as a patient as a family of who you are where you're from what you believe what you need and perhaps uh, go get some training so that I can really support you um, and support. Uh, policy and education and curriculum to meet you where you're at um, so that this the, the bridge can be a lot stronger and I can practice in a culturally relevant uh, community-centered, patient-centered, and empowered way. So that means taking into account the individual experience, the mind, body, the genetics, the cognition, the emotions, the spiritual uh, needs of that person, their interrelational, interpersonal, social um, dynamics that might be going on, the, the kind of structural and physical aspects of their built environment, connection to nature, community, society, organization, institution, systems, and policies that impact their health. And then even on a bigger um, level, the culture, the cultural um, integrity of who that person is. Uh, do they come from a collectivist influence? Um, what are, what's their language? How, how do I actually um, communicate with them in a way that sits well with, with what they need and what they're looking for and what suits them the best? And, uh, and so what this connects to is kind of the, the semantics of 
uh, cultural um, competency versus humility versus, you know, how do we do this? Um, and I have to say uh, that one of the biggest components is to practice our own, um, looking at our own processes and working through our own um, grief and struggles and failures and mistakes, etc. cetera, um, but also practicing humility to where, 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 how do we meet people where they're at? A lifelong commitment of self-evaluation and self-critique, uh, asking, learning how to ask for feedback from our patient. How did that come across to you? When I explain things in this way, you know, what did you understand? Um, you know, how, how, how do you sit with what this uh, potential treatment plan is from based on your culture or based on who you are as a person right now, what you believe in? Um, and of course, all of this takes time, right? So uh, cookie cutter medicine of just checking off a bunch of boxes, finding a diagnosis and giving a prescription uh, doesn't make room for this level of authenticity, exchange, empowerment, but that's what um, is needed. You know, that's where our communities um, are at. And that's where part of the mistrust of the healthcare system for a lot of the minoritized communities comes from is that to, to meet people where they're at in this more holistic way um, does require more training of us uh, and more um, and a different way to practice medicine, different policies, different um, healthcare structure, and, and to bring institutional accountability to it, that it's not just our, our role as physicians or healthcare providers, but that we're within a system that also needs to, to shift and meet the needs of the people in this more uh, trauma-informed, culturally congruent, hum humble way. Um, I can say a lot more about uh, the, the debate about cultural competence versus safety versus humility versus proficiency, but needless to say, we have a lot of work to do <laughs> uh, in medicine and in our society in general, um, and also in psychiatry. And I'm going to make all of these slides available to you um, so that you can come back and look at some of these. Uh, so an integrative psychiatry evaluation process, um, generally because of this time uh, issue that we've just <laughs> spoken about, um, generally it requires uh, to have the patient or the family fill out an intake packet before they come into the evaluation. Because as you can imagine, learning about the person's uh, medications and uh, medical history and surgical history and uh, culture and learning abilities and all of these things, there's no way to do that all in a one hour evaluation. So, so we try to get as much of this um, information uh, in the written form from, from the patient or the parent in, ca in case of a child psychiatry visit. Uh, that way, the, the initial uh, visit itself can be um, use, utilized as a place to really build trust and rapport and, and get to know the person on these other levels that cannot be just written on a piece of paper. Uh, so to, to turn that evaluation into a strength-based, um, uh, collaborative, trauma-informed, culturally humble, motivational, collaborative um, session that really builds that beginning trust with, with the provider. Um, and so the, the packet that's sent to the patient can include all kinds of things from from the usual stuff we ask for, family history and social history, et cetera, to development, to gut health, to hormonal cycles, to uh, learning about how um, how that this person's immune system uh, has been, you know, historically from ear infections and tubes as a baby to tendency towards seasonal allergies to their COVID history to uh, tendency towards, you know, asthma and allergies and migraines and cramps and and various other parts of the physical health that can actually tell us that there is a, a history or tendency towards systemic inflammation or to the gut not absorbing nutrients that the person is trying to take in or some other um, aspect of 
their health that can be contributing to the mental health presentation. Um, how well do they illuminate? How, what is the nutrition that they have access to? Do they live in a food desert where the only grocery store anywhere near them only has, you know, really highly processed foods and, um, and they don't have access to, to healthy options? Uh, trauma, uh, really learning about little T traumas, big T traumas, uh, relational uh, supports, uh, belief system, meaning purpose. Uh, and then what do they want out of their treatment? And then putting this together into a biopsychosocial formulation. And then the evaluation process can continue with scales and surveys of all sorts, and probably uh, quite a bit more um, nuanced to lab testing than a conventional psychiatry um, evaluation. So it can uh, go into uh, vitamin B12 and D and high sensitivity C-reactive protein and RBC magnesium and ferritin and serum zinc and other testing, depending on what the presentation is, and doing this all mindful of cost insurance coverage. Putting together a treatment plan that um, uh, includes a formulation that can be um, shared with the patients so that they understand like and they're part of, of, of that formulation. Uh, in a way that makes sense to them, um, and incorporating nutrition, nutrition education, either by referral or throughout the follow-up visits, mind-body skills training, usually through referrals or incorporating them through the appointments, psychotherapies of all sorts, uh, supplements as they're appropriate based on the evidence and what the patient is needing and or is interested in and or can afford, uh, and a variety of other uh, therapies, access to Ayurvedic practitioners or Chinese medicine or body work or something else, again, depending on what is available in the community, what the patient's needs and interests are, and what the evidence is. And then psychopharmacology is appropriate. So as you can see, when you have all of those options, you may be a lot less likely to jump to writing a prescription if you feel empowered and you know about all these other things. And a lot of times the patients um, might actually appreciate that. Um, and then the evaluation process continues with continued evaluation, building trust, assessing response, adding, changing, augmenting, and maintenance treatment. Documentation is a huge part of this emerging field of integrative medicine and psychiatry. So we train all of our residents and fellows to um, provide a, a brief documentation in the chart, um, both to communicate with all the other physicians and clinicians who may not know the evidence behind the use of inositol for OCD or L-theanine for sleep or whatever, but also um, for medical legal purposes, because again, a lot of our um, training has not included these things and there is so much to learn and teach each other and share with each other. I've had so many ED docs and residents who have called me saying, Dr. Rajbar, I started taking L-theanine for sleep because I read about it from a chart of a patient and I went and looked it up and, and thought I'd try it and you know, whatever. So it's interesting how educating um, our our fellow colleagues um, can also be a byproduct. Uh, building blocks of health really include all of these different things. So making sure to address their presence or absence within a um, person's life so that as we build the, the collaborative treatment plan, we take into account what's missing and how to empower this person to connect with their sense of meaning and purpose, because without that, it might be really hard to meet their health goals. And, and so now in a little whirlwind, um, I'm going to share with you a few of the of these building blocks and kind of how they connect with mechanisms of action within this field. And, um, and, and just to kind of very big overview, because each of these is like a whole course unto itself and lifelong learning. So let's start with nutrition. We are what we eat. So we know. Uh, that sound nutrition is the first building block of good health. 
poor prenatal nutrition even is associated with all kinds of risks of the child later in life. Uh, things like high fructose corn syrup uh, and many other preservatives and additives actually have um, influence, a negative effect on cognition and other processes that are uh, going on in the brain and the nervous system. Uh, things like omega-3 fatty acids are actually uh, essential for building a resilient nervous system that has optimal neuroplasticity and able to learn and rewire and re-network, which is part of what the healing journey needs. So if you take a depleted brain and then you put it through all kinds of therapy and give it a lot of medication, uh, you're almost like setting it up to not be successful because it needs the building blocks to be able to do all these other things. Um, so just moving along, the gut-brain connection, as we're learning, has a lot to do with it. Dysbiosis, when the gut is not able to properly uh, digest and absorb nutrients, then people uh, can develop all kinds of uh, issues, both from an immune system perspective, GI perspective, um, and mental health perspective, because part of the stress resiliency actually requires a healthy gut with uh, a microbiome that is diverse and, and, um, and healthy so that it can actually do all the, all the things that the, the nervous system needs it to do. Um, the impact of antibiotic exposure and how that can impact risks for depression, anxiety, uh, psychosis, a very, very interesting field area of the field to look into, uh, that even a single antibiotic use, uh, course was associated in the study with increased risk for depression. So again, the microbiome, um, can have a lot to do with it. And, and the reason the microbiome is so important is that the nervous system requires a whole bunch of micronutrients to, for all the processes and um, neurotransmitters and cellular reactions to actually go smoothly. And so, and there are only a few of these that we actually have um, regular lab testing for. So we have a lab test for vitamin D 25 hydroxy, or we have B12, or we have calcium and red blood cell magnesium, but we don't have good tests for thiamine B1 and B6 and choline and selenium and vitamin D and vitamin E and many others. And so what happens is sometimes we just check, you know, if we know how to check these things and can figure out a way for insurance to pay for them, we check them. And those are the only things we know that are low, if they're low. And we basically just don't know about the rest. And, and the issue is that because of agricultural practices and what we've done envi environmentally, unintentionally, I would hope to our earth over the past couple hundred years, is that the soil no longer has the nutritional quality it used to have a couple hundred years ago. And so even for someone with means who has access to healthy food, who eats a you know, variety of vegetables, even that person is not getting the magnesium and zinc and whatever they used to get 200 years ago from that same um, vegetable. And so we have a huge problem of nutritional depletion in our system, in our, in our world, that um, is likely contributing to all kinds of uh, conditions, but because nutrition has been a very, very uh, under-recognized area of medicine and uh, medical school education and curriculum, um, it is kind of going um, missed in a lot of these cases and attention is being put into treatment modalities that um, actually would work a lot better if the nutritional piece was in a better place. So long story short, um, there's been incredible work done by Dr. Charles Popper and many others on what happens if you give single micronutrients. You check the lab, it shows B12 is low, you give them B12. What happens with that compared to a broad spectrum micronutrient approach to treating mood disorders, uh, ADHD, many other things? I highly recommend these articles that I shared at the end as well. 
And uh, turns out that single micronutrient interventions help some but they're actually not as helpful um, in a lot of cases as a broad spectrum micronutrient intervention. So over the past 20 to 30 years, there's been several trials um, and several randomized uh, double-blind placebo control trials looking at uh, broad spectrum micronutrient formulations, mostly out of Canada, for ADHD, for example, for mood regulation, for aggression, for uh, for cognition, for um, uh, emotion regulation in autism, for example. And, and the research is pretty, um, I mean, it's up and coming, but it's, it's changed the way I practice medicine and the way we train residents now. Uh, the most uh, recent uh, trial uh, is done by our colleagues out of New Zealand, um, Dr. Julia Rutledge, as well as Jenny Johnstone and many others. Uh, uh, out of Oregon, uh, the MADI trial that was just um, published in the Journal of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, looking at the impact of broad spectrum micronutrients on emotion regulation, uh, in particular in ADHD in children. Um, and it's pretty, pretty significant results that I encourage you to um, go beyond this presentation because we don't have a lot of time. Um, so there's an excellent uh, book uh, that came, just came out by Dr. Julia Rutledge and Bonnie Kaplan uh, called The Better Brain um, that you're welcome to check out all kinds of Carlat Psychiatry podcast and reports on the topic and, and other places that this material is now being provided as part of the field of integrative psychiatry, nutritional psychiatry, integrative medicine. Uh, to really be incorporated into how we practice and how we educate ourselves, how we treat our own bodies, but also how we um, offer uh, what we offer to patients and how we present the material. Other supplements that um, have some evidence that are um, safe enough, evidence-based enough that we're incorporating into the integrative psychiatry curriculum include things like inositol, L-theanine, lavender oil capsules um, under Lavella or Selexin um, brands, uh, N-acetylcysteine, L-methylfolate, um, but really beyond the specifics, uh, teaching residents, uh, families, uh, and patients how to look information up so that they can see, you know, was this product third-party tested? Uh, how much does it cost? What is the research behind it? Um, and the consumer lab portal, as well as natural medicines database, um, and might have been are good places for where we te teach and train the residents um, of how to learn this material and then eventually incorporate it into their clinical practice. The other mechanism I want to mention briefly is this mechanism of inflammation, which actually goes together with um, acute and chronic stress, trauma, and self-regulation. One of my most esteemed mentors, Dr. Chuck Raison, is actually responsible for this excellent slide. <laughs> I want to thank him here. Um, so what we know is that if you look at um, inflammatory markers uh, and you kind of look at normal healthy adults versus people with psychiatric conditions versus people with autoimmune conditions or an acute infection like COVID or something, um, that there is something that we can learn about that. So here's a normal healthy inflammatory scale. Here's autoimmune. Here is acute infection. And where are psych conditions? So they're not, so people in general, people with psychiatric illness um, have an inflammatory markers that are higher than the normal healthy adult, but much lower than someone with an acute infection or an autoimmune disease. So there's something here that has called attention in the field. And what we are learning is that when there is a system, systemic inflammatory markers raised in, in people's uh, bloodstream, that it impacts uh, general cognitive symptoms, emotional processing, affect regulation, social processing, circadian rhythms, so sleep, energy levels, fear response, and reward pathways, so basically everything. Uh, and there's evidence that uh, a lot of treatment-resistant depression, the way it's been defined, is actually associated with increased inflammation. 
Um, and I'm going to skim through some of these because we could really spend a lot more time on each of them. But if you look at some of the hypotheses of neurobiology of depression, just as an example, uh, there's the monoamine hypothesis that, you know, if you look at that, perhaps you could think of treatment modalities like nutrition or supplements or SSRIs or whatever addressing the monoamine hypothesis. The BDNF hypothesis, you can think of exercise, ECT, TMS, deep brain stimulation as, as under the mechanistic um, treatments for the BDNF hypothesis. The NMDA receptor role, you can think of ketamine, the HPA axis, you can think of oxytocin, mind-body skills training, and uh, vagal tone as a, as a mechanism. You can think of VNS, again, mind-body skills types of, of trainings, uh, brain hemispheric asymmetry on EEG. You can think of neurofeedback and mind-body skills again. And then under the auspices of inflammation as a, a mechan hypothesis of you know, some of uh, what we see in depression. Uh, you can think of nutrition, supplements, that gut health that we talked about, exercise, mind-body skills, uh, uh, dopamine and ECT as kind of how, how inflammation can be addressed if, if that's what's going on within the depression um, uh, hypothesis. And so uh, that's kind of the infl inflammation story, which um, I acknowledge there's a lot more to say about it as well. And then uh, the last piece that I want to focus on is mind-body skills and mind-body medicine and, and where does this fit in within, within the field and why it's so important. And mind-body medicine is really a branch within integrative medicine or psychiatry, but it, it um, in many ways, it says the same thing that we've been saying in this presentation is that a, a way of looking at medicine that really interacts, that really focuses on how does the brain, the mind, the body, behavior, emotion, uh, culture, uh, safety uh, interact, um, and, and how does the emotional, mental, social, spiritual, behavioral, cultural factors are impacting health, and it, uh, it, really respects and empowers each person's capacity for self-awareness, self-knowledge, self-care, and co-care, co-regulation, how we can support each other within our communities, um, and emphasizes techniques that are grounded in thousands of years of various cultures, like meditation, like guided imagery, like the utilization of ceremony and ritual, for example, um, that are, are now gaining uh, research and evidence-based for supporting health. And they are everything from various forms of active and passive and expressive meditations to biofeedback and neurofeedback and imagery and use of autogenics and creative expression through art and music and movement, um, relationship with food, relationship with nutrition, how we eat, not just what we eat, uh, and the utilization of various um, culturally congruent ceremonies and rituals and connection with mean, a sense of meaning and purpose for people, and the importance of group support and community. And the evidence is increasing on every one of these in stress reduction, immune function, or cancer care, or hypertension, attention, brain structure, insomnia, heart disease, uh, chronic pain, uh, you name it, there is expanding evidence that paying attention to these things, incorporating these techniques, um, and the group support community uh, piece is absolutely essential to reducing the cost of healthcare, enhancing um, people's uh, functionality, and um, supporting them to find a life that has meaning and joy in it. Um, this all has a lot to do with the autonomic nervous system and our need to stay to learn how to get our gas pedal and brake pedal, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic branches of our autonomic nervous system to, uh, to spring back into a resilient form so that we don't get so hyper stimulated or so shut down that 
the chronicity or the acuteness of these uh, rises and falls contributes to all kinds of things from depression, anxiety, insomnia, chronic pain, um, uh, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, uh, you name it. And um, this is a paper on adverse childhood experiences and trauma-informed care that my partner and I co uh, authored. Um, that has a lot to do with gut health as well as the vagal tone um, and how, how we practice our vagal nerve uh, tone and stimulation can support trauma healing. People who have lost their voice, we'll talk more about this a little bit later in the presentation, uh, to reconnect with a sense of, I have a voice, I have a place, I, I, my opinion matters, my feelings matter. Um, helping people learn how to breathe, relearn how to breathe. Um, helping folks um, gain a, a better sense of how they're taking care of their internal organs um, through mind-body skills, through nutrition, through awareness of how all of these things interact. And it actually influences every possible disease process. So mind-body skills uh, are best taught in community and in groups because the group ends up becoming a container within which this process of awareness and speaking up and feeling um, heard and putting together that narrative in a healthier way of who am I, why am I here, why do I struggle, what, what is good and strong about who I am and where I come from, all of that can take place. I'm going to skip through some of this. Uh, actually, some of the early mind-body skills research was done um, with Georgetown medical students, their particular uh, stressed population. I can uh, vouch for that as myself as a medical student. Um, also in adolescents and kids in war zones in Kosovo and Gaza. I'm going to skip through some of this because um, you're welcome to look at it. There's uh, research uh, with veteran populations here in the U.S. We have mind-body skills groups in academia for all of our psychiatry residents starting their first year of internship, July through September, is a 10-week, two hours per week mind-body group that really creates uh, a basic uh, skills and introduction and safety and really learning about each other and how to support each other early on in the residency training, which I wished I had had when I was an intern at Middlesex or a resident here. Um, uh, you're welcome to look at our paper in academic psychiatry about what we're learning um, over the past eight years of doing this work with residents. And, and then I'm going to finish with talking a little bit about uh, curriculum and opportunities for you to learn more or introduce others who may be interested. So the integrative psychiatry curriculum, which started in 2015, now it's in eighth it is in its eighth year, um, started here at the University of Arizona um, by myself and Dr. Amelia Villagomez with mentorship from a lot of amazing people. And basically the goals are to improve resident knowledge in this evidence-based field that is expanding in evidence exponentially, you know, seems like daily, um, enhance wellness and self-awareness and burnout prevention for ourselves, for the residents, but also um, incorporate this knowledge over time into clinical practice. It's a collaboration between the Andrew Weil Center and the Department of Psychiatry and Center for Mind Body Medicine and a lot of other um, amazing people, probably some of them in this audience. Uh, the program is based here, but we have um, sites all over um, and have five other institutions and and um, so they can access the curriculum for their residency and then we mentor them in how to incorporate it to make sense for their setting for their uh, program and for their faculty and residents. Uh, it involves a, an evidence-based curriculum that's about 120 hours long. It can be um, a longitudinal uh, a curriculum offered for like residents in their PGY three or four year when they have more time to uh, learn and incorporate some of this into their patient care. We have monthly Zoom meetings um, that are internationally accessible by medical students, residents, fellows, and faculty all over the place. 
uh, faculty development every year. Um, two or three times a year, we gather and support all the faculty from all the different um, centers who are uh, teaching their residents this material and learning as they go. Mind body skills groups for residents, scholarly opportunities, professional training opportunities. We have a YouTube playlist with many, many presentations that have been given at these monthly meetings that are in different integrative psychiatry topics. And we have a Facebook group of about 2,200 integrative psychiatrists, um, and as well as medical students, residents, fellows all over the country. Uh, this is the evidence-based curriculum that I mentioned. Um, and each of these topics uh, goes into a lot of detail with links to PubMed for every, uh, almost every sentence in the, in the curriculum. So that it's highly evidence-based and it's uh, updated every two years because of the new evidence that is brought in. Here is the Facebook group. If any of you would like to join, there's a separate one that is just MD and DO um, focused. And there's another one that, in, um, that welcomes therapists and PhDs and, and other practitioners who are not in the MD, DO community. Our six um, IMR psychiatry sites are, of course, ourselves, University of New Mexico, um, where Dr. Katzman um, has uh, we have mutual connections, University of South Florida under the leadership of Dr. Stock uh, and uh, Dr. Kalibi. Uh, uh, at New Mexico, we have Dr. Pence, Des Moines Mercy Care, Dr. Sophia Kang, uh, Dr. Arya Soman and colleagues at Northwell Suc uh, Zucker Hillside and uh, Dr. Athoda at the Heinz VA in Chicago, Loyola University that now has an integrative psychiatry one-year fellowship for residents who have just graduated and want to do a residential fellowship, highly recommend. Um, there is an opportunity to get board certified, um, fellowship and certification opportunities at all of these different um, uh, institutes that you're welcome to access if you have interest. Um, uh, here is the Center for Mind-Body Medicine and the Academic Consortium for Integrative Medicine and Health, which is really the, the body that supports academic institutions who are uh, uh, reaching for excellence in education, clinical practice, and research within this expanding field of integrative medicine. And, um, and a lot of our residents and fellows and faculty are very active in leadership in this body. We also apply this work to our work with uh, minoritized and indigenous and immigrant and international populations. So this is the native youth camp that is now being um, studied as part of an NIMH R01, looking at uh, nutrition, physical activity, parenting support, and mind-body skills training as a comprehensive model of um, uh, impacting uh, diabetes and metabolic syndrome uh, markers for native youth in Arizona. We also have uh, philanthropic grants that supports Indigenous people and those serving Indigenous people to go through training professionally and then bring this work to their community centers. We are in the midst of some uh, collaborations with um, actually one of the psychiatry professors at Yale, Dr. Anahita Basirnia, who created the Tian Foundation, as well as many, many other um, excellent partners to utilize this field and what we're learning to support crisis response in Iran and Afghanistan and in the diaspora through mind-body skills training and professional training of um, mental health practitioners. These are some of our incredible gifted leaders in Iran that are getting trained as psychologists and physicians and taking this work internet, um, into their villages and communities and cities in Iran. Uh, from uh, every, every possible way you can imagine in the midst of a, an exceptionally difficult time. This is a clinic in uh, southern Tehran that is uh, facilitating some of these groups for people with chronic illness, etc. And I'm going to uh, end there with special thanks to my colleagues, uh, Dr. Villa Gomez, Dr. Rezan, Kaplan, Julia Rutledge, Jenny Johnstone, 
James Gordon, Scott Shannon, um, many, many others who are not on this screen. And end with a Rumi quote um, that is near and dear to my heart and a painting that I did recently, uh, actually a couple of years ago as part of my own uh, continued self-awareness journey. Yesterday I was clever, so I wanted to change the world. Today I am wise. I wish I could really say that. <laughs> Today I'm a little wiser, so I'm changing myself. Thank you very much. And I have lots and lots of um, articles and uh, references for you to come back to if you wish. Um, thank you, Dr. Katzman. Dr. Ryan, thank you so much for such such a wonderful, wonderful presentation. What a an honor to get to learn from you. And um, we have questions that are coming in for the from the chat already. And um, everyone out there, if you have a question for Dr. Ranjbar, please go ahead and put that in. I I know she just want to tell you that uh, I was a resident with uh, Chuck Rezone a long ago at UCLA. Yeah, yeah. So fun to see uh, see his name in your world. Um, it is a small world. That's the other thing I've learned is. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of curious, um, just to start us off with questions. You have kind of a, a program for interested residents um, to to. Um, participate in, in this program. If you were to take um, some components that um, really should be required of all of all residency, kind of general residency trainings, what do you think are the most important ones um, that are currently missing that, that you would feel the most passionate about? Oh, it's a, it's a million dollar question. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I can tell you what our program directors here at the University of Arizona mm -hmm the residency program directors say. <laughs> uh, they have, you know, watched this develop and, you know, they have all these residents who come here because of the curriculum and they can't just have all the residents who want this to be the only residents that come here. So, so it's been an interesting um, process uh, for them. I can say that the one thing they don't want to go away over and over every year is the mind-body skills group at the beginning of internship. Mm. Because when you build relationships, when you build skills for those 12 interns who come from all over and are trying to figure out what it means to be a psychiatrist and support themselves so that they don't get burned out and know how to reach out for help, uh, there's very little that can replace that kind of bonding and connection and skills building on day one. Of course, the additional things about nutrition and the gut and, you know, how to prescribe this and that and you know inflammation like all of those things they love incorporating those into didactics and in second year third year so that the residents begin to incorporate some of the evidence into the way they think about depression or ADHD or whatever um, but I have to say if they were to just pick one thing I, I I'm pretty sure they would pick the group because it's so experiential and engaging um, and a lot of times in didactics, you know, you just hear something and it doesn't really get processed. So interesting. I, uh, since I know some of the folks out in, uh, out your way, I'm, I'm also interested in, I know you have an outstanding School of Public Health, and I'm kind of wondering, um, uh, are you integrated with the Public Health School and Dr. Helitz are there? Or, or, um... Yeah, so the way we're in integrating with public health, School of Agriculture, um, the psychological services for uh, university students um, is mostly through supporting their leaders and their administrators to go through the mind-body training and then bring those skill sets to their uh, schools, their research work, their community outreach to Hispanic populations or this population or that population. Um, and I think that kind of um, skills building and train the trainer model is is a lot uh, less pricey than you know mm -hmm. something else that um, so so those have been our interactions and because there's so much focus here on border mental health and asylum seekers and indigenous tribal communities a lot of our public health folks are really focused on how you know how many people can we train to then you know, build this into the schools, build this into the clinics, um, into the shelters for the border uh, support folks. Um, so it's it's a long, as, as you can imagine, this is a huge, but I think um, 
uh, the the circle is expanding rapidly, and and that train the trainer model is 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 what needs to happen on a grassroots level. Great, great. Thank you. Um, so so great questions coming in. Let me let me uh, share a few with you from from John Allen. Thank you for this question. Um, he says, I love the way you include personal development along with professional development in integrative psychiatry. Do you incorporate consideration of personal development into training? Yeah, you know, great. Thank you for that question. Um, the way we do that is um, beginning to share our own story. So what I just did with you all, uh, because it takes courage and vulnerability and uh, kind of getting outside of our comfort zone to share certain things about where I've been and how I got to be where I am. And that's usually the most um, powerful way for someone else to consider what does this mean for my journey? Because uh, it's one thing to say, go do your own inner work, go find your therapist, you know, do this and that. But I think the more we as leaders, we as professors, administrators, find that way of connecting the bigger part of who we are with our trainees, um, I think they really appreciate that, both because it doesn't set them up for I have to be perfect, which is one of the worst things we can do for our trainees, but also because then they get ideas of, oh, maybe it's not the end of the world if I have to take a month off or a year off. You know, it's it's expanding the horizons of medicine has the potential more more opportunities to come for the rest of your life but if you don't work on yourself and don't value the body and the mind that needs nurturance along the way you won't have one you know we lose 400 doctors to suicide or more per year um i try to bring that into every presentation and so we are losing our brightest um partly because of that gap of vulnerability and talking about these things and and it has to has start with the leaders because when you're on lowest on the totem pole you're least likely to 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 find courage to be vulnerable if all of your role models look like they have never struggled before great thank you thank you uh, bettina bernstein uh, hi to you thank you uh, uh, i know you from the echo programs and great to see you here today uh, uh, bettina has a a great question for you here it says uh, Dr. Ranjbar, if you have a chance to speak to how children, especially in school settings, are so often mislabeled as having ADHD and needing stimulants when they are reacting to trauma, Dr. Ranjbar has ever such a wonderful talk today. I am so proud to know you as a colleague. Thank you, Dr. Bernstein. So, um, yes, I, I'll share a brief uh, anecdote about this. Um, I work with some of the Native Indigenous uh, schools and children who live in such remote, underserved, underrecognized um, school communities, where literally as soon as a child misbehaves, they are removed from the school system. There is almost no capacity, education, training, for the teachers who are often there for a year at a time, you know, to serve their uh, remote, you know, school pay loan payback requirement before they leave, uh, to barely get to know these children and the culture and the trauma and the history that might be behind the misbehavior that happened in the class today. And so, so what happens, as, as you know, um, my dear Bettina, is, is that the, the labels, the shame that you are a bad kid, you know, you did the bad, you know, you need to go get treated, um, you need to be removed, uh, can be so damaging to the community, to the culture, to the child. Um, and, and, and I wish there was a, there was a quick solution, but I think the training the trainers, training the teachers, helping the teachers connect with their emotions, their trauma, their history, their culture can help build that capacity, that empathy, that capacity to see beyond the behavior and um, be less likely to label, to stigmatize, to remove, to punish a behavior that actually has trauma networks and 
culture and intergenerational trauma, you know, tailgating it. Um, and uh, yeah, so great question. And I wish I wish there was a quick solution. Hey, thank you. Um, thank you, Nosheen. Thank you, Bettina, for the question. Uh, uh, Suda Rosa uh, types in, I would like to just say thank you for an incredibly comprehensive review. The gut-brain connection, importance of nutrition, and change in our current food industry, nutritional value is a huge topic. Is this part of medical school curriculum? Are these topics being beginning to be integrated into psychotherapist curriculum? Ah, uh, thank you, Suzanne. So, um, they are certainly when I went to medical school, it was not uh, incorporated 25 years ago now. I think it's still much of this is not yet incorporated. It is beginning to be talked about a little bit. Um, I, in one of my many hats that I wear, I'm one of the psychiatrists for medical students who are struggling here at the University of Arizona. And so when I treat them, I have them read a lot of these things that I teach them. <laughs> and so that's my, uh, you know, hidden way of incorporating what they should have in their curriculum, because so many of them are burned out, anxious, have never, you know, looked at their vitamin D level, are eating, you know, Cheetos and sleeping all odd hours of the day or not at all. So, um, and it's impacting their health and their cognition and they have ADHD and they need stimulants and, you know, whatever. So, so I'm, I'm utilizing, and, and I say this for all of you is to, whenever you have a sphere of influence, learn, bring what you are learning into that sphere. So as a mental health counselor for the medical students, I give them a curriculum, <laughs> um, which they really appreciate. And they say, wow, I had no idea, you know, I could do this or I sh should learn about my inflammatory markers or look at my gut function. Um, and so someday when they become full-fledged doctors, they will remember and, you know, incorporate that. But I think we have a long way to go. Uh. Great. There's some great questions in here. Um, um, let me get to um, Meg Weissman um, is saying uh, finally something related to integrative therapy. The mind and body can't be separated despite the, the ways things are taught and presented in our culture. Why do you think it's taken so long for us to work with these ideas? Hmm. Thank you for that question. Um, you know, my I'll give you my honest answer. I think that a militaristic uh, approach to health has been kind of the backdrop of our medical school and healthcare system, kind of this hierarchy of uh, things in boxes and, you know, kind of a boot camp. And, and, and that approach both is it's more a patriarchal approach and it tends to divide and conquer versus nurture and empower and collaborate and um, and heal. <laughs> so, so I think that's, you know, if you look at the Cartesian dualism of the mind and the body are separate, at some point we started putting things in boxes and separating because it's simpler. You know, it's like you can just divide them, send this person to the shrink and send that, that person to the family doc. <laughs> And, and hope they get what they need, you know, in one or the other. But the reality is that the brain is connected to everything, that everything is connected to everything. We're all interdependent and connected. So, so that mentality that is divisive and separatist and cookie cutter and simple only goes so far when you have a world that is so complex and now so interconnected and so culturally rich and so diverse. So what I see is that the, the need for that, um, you know, for lack of better word, um, the right brain to connect with the left brain, the, the divine feminine to connect with the, the masculine strength is now being seen more than ever because of George Floyd, because of COVID, because of the border crisis, because of ongoing wars. Uh, so we're beginning to recognize that the old way of separating is just not going to cut it. And we have to figure out how to 
how to become whole and it's going to take time. But um, I think that's why we've kind of done it the other way because we tried to get away with the simple, uh, you know, a pill for every ill solution that just doesn't work. Along, so thank you. Thank you. Along those lines, Stephen Greenberg has two huge questions in here. You, one you were just getting at um, says, do you recognize the impact of the disturbing political and social issues that we are dealing with in this country? And if so, how do you address them in your work um, with integrative psychiatry? Um, and then just if, if that's not a big enough question here, um, what role does AI play or do you envision it playing in either information gathering, treatment planning, and or monitoring? Um, so I don't know, yeah, if you've thought about um, AI at all. You were kind of getting to the first question. Um, yeah, thank you. How do, um, we, how do we come together? It's one of my favorite parts of giving these talks is all these questions at the end that just make me realize um, how rich our communities are and how these discussions can hopefully lead to innovative ways to move forward together. So yes, uh, you know, even mentioning where I come from in this talk, um, telling my residents about uh, what I struggled with uh, socially, politically, racially, uh, systemically, burnout wise, I think, again, it comes to um, how do we blend the the authentic and the professional in a way that um, allows room for incorporating topics like policy, like politics, like social determinants of health into our curricula because they are not separate. Uh, you can talk about evidence for whatever all you want if the person doesn't have the means to <laughs> get access to that modality. It, the evidence has no no um, application for that patient, that community in front of you who can't afford it or, you know, lives in a remote area. Um, so, so yes, that's part of it. And that's part of our faculty development. So when we support the, uh, the site leaders at each of our sites and or when I um, provide mentorship to those who are bringing these curricula, part of that is supporting us to bring these nuances. And a lot of the, the, discussion about the social political issues come up when we're actually working in the community. Because when you have a patient come to a, a, a building, you know, a square building, it's, it's a little harder for them to bring their full culture into who they are and what they need. But when you go out into their community, when the residents go, you know, to a reservation here and see what's going on, it changes the conversation a little bit because you can, it's almost like out of sight, out of mind. So part of the division is that patients come to us a lot of times. And so it's easy for us to not think about all the determinants unless they feel safe enough to tell us about them or we have time to ask everything. So anyway, I could say a lot about that. And AI, <laughs> AI is... Um, it, it'll be interesting. I, I'm sure it has a, a role to play. Uh, and artificial intelligence uh, will never be able to get at these nuances uh, and the heart of the matter the way that the integrative field will require. Uh, so it can it can help, but it can't replace. Um, I tell the residents and the and the fellows, like we are the medicine, the techniques, the tools, the diagnosis, the stuff we learn and we offer. But the person that is in front of this other person interacting, building trust, the body language, the tone, the vulnerability, the courage, um, the AI can only do so much to, to replace that. Thank you for the question. Great, great. I'm going to group a couple of questions here. Um, first, um, in the chat is uh, a bunch of thank yous for, for the presentation, Dr. Ranjbar. And, and, um, and someone writes in, how can we work more with these ideas and better connect and understand them? It seems we need to have them more integrated with medical school. I've heard it is not really a part of the curriculum. So many doctors don't connect or work with these ideas. It has been hard to wait. I've been interested in, in these ideas for over 40 years. And then 
as well, somebody, um, uh, Marianne Austin writes in, how would we find trained integrative psychiatrists in our area of, of Connecticut? Uh, so, so why is it taken so long and, um, and how, how do people connect with somebody who, who has expertise in integrative psychiatry? Those would be the grouping of the questions there. Uh, the, the first answer, thank you for all the questions, uh, is that it takes time from the time evidence shows something to when it becomes part of the curriculum and clinical practice. They say about it's 17 years from the time something is, you know, innovatively found or uh, realized to when you actually see it in the medical school curriculum or you go to your doctor and there it is. So, um, that's that's part of it. And then how do you find an integrative psychiatrist? Thankfully, there are more and more networks that are um, having links where you can search. So um, I will share some in the PDF that I will share with you. Um, the same here, Global Nonprofit now has an integrative psychiatry search box where you can look for them. The Andrew Weil Center has one. The Integrative Psychiatry Institute now has one. So you can actually go into these sites and, and see in your zip code, you know, who is trained. Um, and we have a lot of work to do as far as board certification and all of that still, but at least you can get a sense of who's in your area and look them up individually. Great. I, I to uh, conclude here, uh, Kelly Roberts has a question that says, thank you, Dr. Ranjbar. In our clinic, there's a longstanding debate about offering brief interventions for mental health issues versus focusing our efforts on offering individual and group therapy services without a session limit. I'm curious to hear your opinion. You know, ideally, I would like there to be um, an eight or 10 week group series that people can join while they're on a waiting list to get seen by the psychiatrist or by, by the individual therapist. You know, this that sense that we're getting, um, as I imagine you all agree, is that the, the amount of need of mental health, trauma, cultural needs, community needs is always going to surpass the number of trained clinicians and psychiatrists. Um, and so group efforts, community-based efforts, train the trainer models can, can help reduce the burden of the one-on-one -on -one interactions that there's never going to be enough to, to truly serve the entire population. Um, so I suggest incorporating uh, brief interventions. I think of, you know, two months, eight weeks, two hours a week, something to build skills, to educate, to, to model some of these types of needs while people are who need additional to that wait on the waiting list or um, et cetera. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Ranjbar, I, I, uh, I guess I have one last question in that you, you told us so much about your background in such a uh, courageous and wonderful way to model for all of us. Um, how do you think that that has really, if you were to sum it up, how has that background informed what you're doing these days? Uh, thank you for that. I think uh, struggles and closed doors and um, conflicts don't phase me as much. Mm. You know, I think the more you learn and build resilience and fight through and, and see miracles happen when least expected, uh, one begins to expand in a way to leave room for the unknown and the unseen and the misunderstood. Um, and I still struggle, you know, <laughs> I'm not done. Um, but I think I have, I have a larger um, perspective now than when I was a, a scared little girl, you know, with no idea how I would ever work through particularly the grief um, that I certainly wasn't ever taught how to how to begin to work with early on. So I wish that childhood education and processing for all of our children. Thank you. So, so fantastic. Well, it has been an honor to get to spend some time with you. And thank you, Dr. Angela, for sharing your story, sharing all of your amazing work, um, all that you've developed and um, what you're doing uh, for uh, years and years of 
of people going through training from from multiple disciplines. It's uh, it's really tremendous work and so important for all of us to learn about it and uh, to learn about these resources. So thank you, um, thank you so so much for for joining us and thank you everybody out there for joining us uh, from wherever you are. You know, it's a it's a weird uh, moment right now in that we'll we've been together and now we'll just separate into our own our own spots and go into our next hour of meetings or wherever we're going. So. Um, uh, if, uh, before that happens, though, I'll remind you that uh, if you would like CEU or CME, uh, um, that link will pop up as soon as uh, the session is over. So thank you, everybody. Um, thank you again, Dr. Anjwar, and uh, it's good to spend time together. See you in a couple of weeks, everyone out there. Bye-bye.